Hello, friends. Welcome to The Way Home, Cross North Communities for Children's Facebook Live Show and our podcast. My name is Holly Kessler, and I'm the Senior Director of Community Relations here at Cross North. We come on Facebook Live every Tuesday afternoon, and I get to talk with some of our staff or maybe a community partner about the work that we're doing at Cross North, the child welfare system, um, ways that we're engaging in our communities, lots of different topics. But if you miss our live show, you can always rewatch on our Facebook page or catch the show on our YouTube channel. The podcast comes out on Fridays on our blog, which you can find at crossnore.org. So there are plenty of ways to watch our show and engage with us each week. Today, my guest is Tanya Blackford. Tanya serves Crossnore as the executive director of our Western region, and she's going to tell us about um, who she is and, and what she does. And we're going to talk about some of the work that's being done uh, in that region of North Carolina. So please join me in welcoming Tanya to the show. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Holly. How are you? So happy to be here. I know. I'm glad to have you here. And I'm glad that we uh, caught you on a day that you're in Winston-Salem because you're not always here. So I know. I love it here in Winston. <laughs> That's great. Well, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us about your role at Cross Noor and, you know, anything else you want to share about your life? Sure. Um, my name is Tanya Blackford, and I'm the Western Regional Director for Cross North Communities for Children um, in Henderson uh, County is where our office is, but we serve um, Henderson, Transylvania, Polk, Buncombe County, um, and hopefully some more counties in that area of Western North Carolina. And how long have you been with Cross North, Tanya? When did we open that office there? One would think I would easily know that. I, I'm, I'm going to guess like four and a half years. <laughs> I think guess? that's right. Like summerish of 2018. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that is right. Um, I feel like that's how long we we've known each other. But you have been in the Hendersonville area for a long time and had been serving in another organization, right? Right. So I mean, I um, I've lived in the Henderson County for 20 years. Wow. Um, and have worked with um, lots of different organizations there, but I served as the executive director for Safe Light, um, formerly Mainstay, for 18 of those. Um, so wow. I love the Henderson County area um, and I'm super happy um, about how do we build and bring more services to that area. Well, tell us about that sort of that beginning. What what brought Cross Noor to the Western North Carolina region? What need was there? Tell us how all of that happened and how you made the switch from from Safe Flight to, to Cross Noor. Um, so I think uh, the last, um, well, really the last maybe 10 years, um, became more and more obvious that we were had sort of a, a, a gap in services around mm -hmm. child welfare, um, how children who were experiencing um, some trauma at home, what were the services that were available to them that allowed them to, to reuni reunify, um, do some of that trauma work, uh, you know, a gap in sort of therapeutic services. Um, we opened up a child advocacy center and did some other sort of community organizations and services, but we didn't really have an expert in the area of child welfare um, in that local area who could really partner with and, and add to um, some of the great services that were already being offered. Okay. And so you knew about Cross Noor or you heard about Cross Noor in some way? Uh, well, I, I had not heard of Cross Noor. Okay. Uh, a good friend of mine, um, you know, I, I asked lots of people, like, tell me what organization, you know, really does some great work. Mm -hmm. uh, and repeatedly, people kept saying Cross Noor. Um, I spoke with a local judge, and she said that Cross Noor was the only uh, children's home that children asked to be returned to. Wow. Um, and mm -hmm. the growth and change that she saw in the lives of those children um, made her super excited about going with me and meeting Brett um, and visiting the Avery campus for the first time mm -hmm. um, and really seeing uh, what it looks like to have a, a campus and a community that is all about meeting the needs of children when they need it most. 
Yeah. So at that time, since we didn't really have a, uh, we didn't have a physical presence, certainly in that area, but we were serving some children. Um, Some children had been coming to our Avery campus, as you mentioned, uh, to live until they could uh, return home safely or find permanence elsewhere. Um, So we weren't completely unknown, but then, um, you know, the need came up for us to have a physical presence there. So a lot of times people ask us, do you have a residential campus in Hendersonville? So answer that question and then tell us kind of about the services that Crossner offers in that area. So we don't have a residential campus in Henderson. Um, we have two residential campuses in Winston and then, you know, Avery, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think what we're doing is we're really looking at what are those services that children need um, either to, to, um, to, to deal with some of the trauma or stress that they're experiencing um, or what does housing look like or new services mm-hmm. that really help kids um, be in the county that they live in with their families mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in their schools and and reunify or find permanency, um, but maybe can stay in the communities that they're living. What is what why is that important, um, Tanya, for those children, you know, whether they have to be out of in an out of home placement, you know, maybe just for a few months or maybe it does take longer than that for them to achieve permanence. Why is it important to keep them as close to home as possible? Because we all want a community that we feel safe and loved. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes um, when children experience trauma, they, they don't have good frames of references of what that looks like. Mm-hmm. And so all they know is what they have. Um, and what they have matters. Yeah, uh, It just might not be as safe as it needs to be for them to, to live there. And so you know, right. they have for their schools, churches, neighbors. Um, and so, you know, and what really can help families reunify is to be able to continue that relationship, to mm-hmm. build and grow together. Mm-hmm. You know, most parents don't have kids and think, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a, a not great parent. Yeah. They really love their children. And sometimes that's all they've experienced and they've experienced their own trauma. And so right. then that translates to their, their children experiencing trauma. Yeah. Um, so so we, how do we help whole families be healthy yeah. um, and really wrap around children in ways that really create them as the center of the service mm-hmm. um, while connecting them with some safe and, and, and new services that can really you know, help bridge that gap? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, like you said, keeping if you keep them sort of as the center of the service, then it makes sense to keep them in their community, keep them around as much stuff that's right. familiar to them as possible. And then I also think about for those families who are able to reunify, it's certainly easier to visit your children, to do the things the court asks you to do when your children remain in your community rather than going several counties away. Right. If if you have issues with employment, mental illness, Mm -hmm. substance abuse, transportation, you know, Mm -hmm. asking families to go several hours away to visit their children Mm -hmm. um, when they already have so many sort of traumas and issues that are happening, you you just add an additional burden. I mean, and, and hardship. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and when kids can't be in their home community, you want them to be in a place like Crossdoor where they have access to lots of different services and opportunities um, and safety and resources that can really help bridge lots of those gaps um, and create those safe environments. Okay. So, so like you said, we don't have a residential campus there. So we're, we're recruiting foster families. Mm -hmm. And foster families. Yeah. And then we also offer some therapy services. We have therapeutic services, both outpatient and in Henderson County Public Schools. Okay. That's great. And then we also have been working um, to expand our youth independent living mm-hmm. uh, options in that area, right? Yep. Yeah. Through case so, management services, education. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And youth independent living is for those kids that are beginning to or are aging out of foster care. So we want to provide them some permanency, some housing, some support, you know, to meet their goals, whatever they, if they want to go to college or they want to get a job or they, you know, whatever. I often say to folks that, you know, 18 year olds think they're ready to take on the world, but they're really not, especially those kids that are coming out of foster care. Right. Yeah. And we want the same things for kids in foster care that that all kids want, you right. know, opportunities to play sports, have an activity, find some things that they're good at, 
drive a car, um, mm -hmm. you know, hang out with their friends, um, you know, and, and providing ways that um, that really support and encourage and allow that to be a central part of a child in foster care's life is is essential. Yeah, and necessary. Absolutely. Well, certainly through foster care, and then you mentioned the the Henderson Public Schools through our therapy services. Crosshorn is working with other organizations in the Western North Carolina area. Um, so why do you think it's important for us to collaborate with other local organizations there in, in Henderson and the surrounding counties? Uh, I think partnership is really a key toward great nonprofit work. Um, I think that nonprofits have a responsibility to their community um, in the same way that they have a responsibility to the to the to the populations that they serve. Mm -hmm. um, and that responsibility is around how do we partner with organizations to provide gaps, to look at barriers, to mm -hmm. look at how do we work better together than we do in silos. Um, you know, I, I think that's just how we show up and, and provide really great services is mm -hmm. they become very interactive and very interpersonal with other organizations and groups mm -hmm. as a way of, of being an intricate part of how that community develops, whether or not it is strictly about the services that you're providing. But think mm -hmm. about all the ways and places that, that touch our families' lives, from city government to healthcare organizations to the school mm -hmm. systems. Um, and the more places that you have to interact with, the, the, the places and places where our folks and kids are interacting, the more opportunities we have to learn and grow and be a part of that greater system of yeah. care. Yeah, and I think it's important for us, you know, we we can certainly be one of the experts in, in the child welfare system, but since we are new, relatively new in the last four and a half years to the area, you know, I think, think it was important for us to, to work with other agencies to hear, like you said, what are the gaps? Where is the support needed? What, you know, are there things that Crossroad does well that we can help fill in? Um, are there some places where we need to pull other folks in? So I think that's just part of being the, you know, that community partner is listening well, filling in where we can fill in, not, we don't have to be the end all be all, you know, to all the, to all the que answer to all the questions, but, um, but really, really coming in as a partner and not coming in to say, this is, this is exactly what you need to do. Right. And it's really how we maximize resources and provide better care. Yeah. Um, you know, if we can provide this piece and somebody else can provide this piece and this piece and this piece, we have a whole system of care that is yeah. entirely based on partnership, you know, mm -hmm. shared interest and in, in plans. Um, and, and we are all better for it. We yeah. don't we don't have to be experts in everything to do a few things really, really well. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, one of the newest projects that we have been working in, we do a lot of work with churches. Um, we have a lot of, of church support, um, but also working with churches in their communities. And so um, I know that you've been working with uh, Saluda United Methodist Church and a home that they're purchasing there and that um, looks like it's going to interact with our Bridging Families program. So tell us about that project. And it, to me, it sounds really exciting. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been an amazing experience to work with um, the Methodist Church and, and particularly Saluda First United Methodist Church um, in a new community church um, called Withall, which is in Columbus, mm -hmm. um, North Carolina. Um, and that is really about how does a church be in a community and a community be in a church around how is it that we can provide services mm -hmm. and, and, and church is about service and service is about church right. in a really different way than come into the building and receive something and then mm -hmm. you know, go out in the community and, and, and be your life. Right. Um, and so for the last four years, we've really been working closely around adding to the services that are available in Polk County um, in partnership with um, the Department of Social Services, with all congregation um, and, for, and Saluda First United Methodist Church is a, is a big part of that. Um, Rob Parsons, who is the, the pastor at both of those, around how does the church become sort of a lifelong community member, partner partner? Uh, support system for a family or a child. Uh, you know, a service provider is just a service provider. 
Sure. What people really need are relationships that are lifelong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. so an organization like Crossdoor, we come in, we provide some amazing services for a little while. Um, and what folks need long, lifelong are friends, relationships, contacts, right. a church. Um, and, and I love when Rob talks about he wants to be the lifelong relationship mm-hmm. um, that supports services and implementation. Um, but that's how community partners look, meeting people where they are. Yeah. You know, so whether that's jail or the court system or, you know, providing some of those additional support pieces that families need, um, that's the role of the church that they're wanting to provide. Um, so Solidifers United Methodist Church, and, and we've been talking about bridging families for the past mm-hmm. years and knowing that this was something we were all working toward. Uh, they saved up and, and have been raising money and then have bought the house next door to the church, wow. uh, which will be a bridging family's house. Mm-hmm. Uh, members of that church want to want to be extended family. They, mm-hmm. you know, want all the basketball mm-hmm. and tutoring and um, raise some money for camp and all the things that we want children to have and experience yeah. while being able to keep kids in their county. The other really great thing that, that they're hoping to do is do some of that biological family support. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, oftentimes our, our, you know, our birth families haven't had those, those healthy experiences and relationships. Right. Right. Um, and providing them the support that they need means that they can be a better parent, regardless of what that role is. That child might not ever live in that house, but they are they are that child's parent forever. I mean, right. Um, and so how does that relationship look when it can be safer? better, Mm -hmm. healthier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So you mentioned the Bridging Families program. Um, So I do want to talk about that. But I also was thinking, you know, when you were talking about Crossdoor can come in and and bring in some services, but what does it look like when there are, are other support services that, and I think it was you that said to me a couple of weeks ago, like, children and families know when people are are paid to be in their lives. And we can do that in a compassionate and caring and trauma-informed way. But the reality is that, that that's a service we're providing. And so that's a different sort of relationship than like a church coming alongside a family and helping them, um, supporting them, providing some resources, and just, just helping them become a member of the community. That's a different kind of thing. Right. Yeah. If, yeah. if you already sort of feel left out behind, mm-hmm. uncared for, mm-hmm. um, not connected to members of the community or a church or, or folks at your school, and there's, a, there's the opportunity to have some authentic, sincere interactions and relationships, especially with people who don't have to be there. They're, they're right. there because they want to be. Right. Um, And that's a real different dynamic sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Bridging Families, um, what can you tell us about that is a new program here at Cross Mm Nor and really works to facilitate reunification. So tell us some more about that program. Uh, So, you know. Um, children, children all want to be home. They want to have a place where they can feel safe. And if that can be with their families, that's even better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how does that look to really support both sides, the child and the family around how that can happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so bridging families um, in, in Polk County will keep kids in their home community, um, work really closely with the biological family on some of those support pieces that that family mm-hmm. might need. Um, provide some co-parenting and some shared parenting while providing the children with a safe place to live um, with full-time foster parents um, and in a way that that helps that whole family um, find a, a place of permanency and safety. Yeah, and the, the goal really around bridging families is to get the kids home sooner um, if possible. You know, working your reunification plan can take many months but um, sometimes that's because the, the parents may not have all the resources they need and they, they need some extra support. And so with that shared parenting, as you mentioned, um, you know, they can they can work that plan and meet those those goals much quicker. Um, so that it's really a very exciting program um, that we've had some really good success. I think I saw the other day we've already worked in 
our other locations with 10 children through bridging families. Um, and so they either have been reunified with their families or are working towards that. So that is just a really, really exciting program. But so is everything you've got going on down there. Y'all are busy. We are busy. We're excited. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things that really makes that project really special is, is that it is truly a three-way partnership between Department of Social Services, Cross mm -hmm. and a church. Yeah. Um, and it is all three of those worlds coming together to really figure out and, and look at how do we provide the best care we can mm -hmm. for the children and families that, that need it mm -hmm. um, with, the, with the whole family in mind. Yeah. 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 It's it's kind of the, the best of the public private partnership that we could hope for, I think. Right. And especially in some rural communities where there may not be substance abuse or mental health or housing mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's an uphill battle for families to really think about what progress or change looks like. Mm -hmm. um, if you live in Polk County and you're trying to access a, a substance abuse group, you might have to drive to Asheville. And that group uh, might meet on, at four o'clock, um, you know, and that's an hour drive each way. Mm -hmm, and if you don't have reliable, I mean, so the barriers become even greater. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and, and really what that child wants is a safe place to live at home and, and, and be cared for. And, um, and that's what we want for them. Yeah. Um, so how does that look to really to really be there and provide that? Yeah, well, that's terrific. Well, if somebody's interested in getting involved in the work you guys are doing in the western part of the state, what, how would you suggest that they go about that? Uh, we have this beautiful website that has our address and phone number on it. Um, <laughs> you, you can yeah. Email us. There's lots of different ways to get involved. Um, we are certainly looking for, for churches that want to do more, for individuals. There's lots of places to connect um, and really add to the work that we're, we're trying to do and want to do. Yeah. Well, that is wonderful. Well, T Tanya, thank you so much for your time um, and for telling us all about the work that, that is happening in Western North Carolina. We appreciate that, all that you do for Crossnore and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Holly. Sure thing. Well, friends, as I have thanked Tanya for being with us today, let me also say thanks to each of you who are watching or listening. We so appreciate your time and the opportunity to tell you about Crossnore. For more information, please visit our website at crossnore.org or follow us on our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. That's it for today, but I really hope that you will join us next week again here on the way home. Thanks.